Hello, Zappos. It's the first time I've ever spoken after being struck with a water balloon. <laughs> Tomatoes, vegetables, some fruit, water balloon, though. But I'm Phil, and I'm going to be talking today about my sixth book, The Visual Organization. I'll also be giving away a few copies. Go for about 45 minutes, give or take, and there'll be time for some questions. And this is the sixth book. In the past, I've written about big data and platforms, emerging technologies. And when I'm not writing, I'm speaking, sometimes doing some consulting. And I'm also, as you'll find out shortly, if you haven't noticed it here, a huge fan of the show Breaking Bad, as well as the Canadian power trio Rush. Any Rush fans out there? Nice. Nice. Cool. First prize for the book. Does anyone know what this is? No Googling. First tweet, give her a book. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> this was the first tweet, Jack Dorsey in 2006. Just setting up my Twitter. Twitter didn't used to have the I and E, it was just Twitter. And I want to start today talking about Twitter because you can do some really interesting things with Twitter data. Um, there are also some other trivia questions in there. When I spoke at Netflix headquarters, so much of this book is about Netflix, I thought that would be pretty stupid of me to go to Netflix and tell Netflix what they were doing because they tell me about this much. So I went and talked about Twitter. And there's some really interesting facts about the company. Does anyone here use Twitter? Show of hands. OK. Twitter sports as of the end of March 241 million users, about 20% of whom live in the United States. So it's about 50 million users, about 310 million people in this country. About 16% of the population uses Twitter. And collectively, we send 400 million tweets a day. And it took a bit of a hit last quarter, but market caps hovered around $25 billion, give or take. Well, Twitter is a big company, it's a big deal. If you haven't been paying attention, it's kind of become this global town square, and it's caused revolutions in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, countries like Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, all had long-standing dictatorships fall in large part because of social media and also because of Twitter. And I'll come back to that in a minute. They've really revolutionized global communication. I'm researching a new book now on language and it's really interesting to me to think about how 10 years ago you would never say tweet or hashtag or some of the other memes that have happened because of Twitter. It really is an interesting company. And that's just conceptually. Um, I spend a lot of time working with and around data. And a few months ago, I read an article from Business Week on how each tweet contains 31 pieces of metadata, which is just a fancy way of saying data about data. If you ever read a blog post online, you can think of that post as data. But the tags, the categories, the dates, that's all metadata, data about data. Um, for those of you who are following what happened with the NSA and the prison scandal, no one in the geek community ever thought they'd ever hear President Obama say the word metadata. But there he was talking about how important metadata is. Each tweet contains pretty basic stuff, right? The time of the tweet, the date of the tweet, the location of the tweet, if you have your tagging turned on. Also the device, did anyone hear what happened to Alicia Keys a couple of months ago? Blackberry had hired her as her, its creative director. And she had tweeted out, but as part of the metadata, it was tweeted from an iOS device, and if you're Blackberry, you probably don't want people you're paying a lot of money to publicly tweeting with an iPhone. So there's a lot to be said for made it metadata. And there are other things like hashtags. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. 31 pieces of metadata from each tweet, and that number is just going to go up. For a geek like me, this is even more interesting. These 31 pieces of data include things like whether it's with being withheld because of copyright. Right? If you're tweeting a link to a pirated video or a BitTorrent or something like that, there is a flag with Twitter on the back end that will let you determine if it's been withheld or if it's being withheld in specific countries. If you are, let's say, in Tunisia and you're part of the government and you want to block access to information, well, you can actually do that with some of the Twitter metadata. And is it potentially sensitive information? Now, typically, these are binaries. In other words, they're true or false. It's either sensitive or it's not. It doesn't get into levels. But those fields help people determine if something should be blocked. 
And you can do a lot when you start to think about the type of metadata that Twitter is collecting. As part of the book, I looked at Twitter and some other companies doing really interesting things visualizing their data. Now, the book came out about five months ago, right as the time this was happening in Ukraine. Right? There was major unrest. This is a data visualization of some of the tweets and where they've taken place. Now, I find this really interesting. You can see that a lot of the tweets are taking place in Europe. That kind of makes sense, but not so much in China. Well, why? Well, there is no Twitter in China. Government blocks it. They have an equivalent service, but there are also a lot of tweets in the eastern part of the United States, New York, Washington. Again, that makes sense, right? You have a lot of political pundits in Washington, D.C. They're going to be tweeting about things. We don't see much in Africa or in South America. So this was just one of the many interesting data visualizations I saw on Twitter, and I'm gonna cover a few more in a while. Book contest number two, what is the record for the most retweets? Yes, you got it. I know if you wanted the exact number. Yep. There you go. It's around 3.4, but this was Ellen's selfie at the 2014 Oscars. Now, those of you who've been using Twitter for a while, and I joined in, I think it was late 2008, we used to see the fail whale all the time. Twitter was broken. It couldn't handle the, band, the, the amount of uh, the number of tweets. Twitter barely breaks anymore, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a while, but this broke Twitter. There were something like 780,000 retweets within 24 hours. Uh, I retweeted it. Why not? And uh, get in on the action. But yeah, this is Ellen at the Oscars. And it, the total was 3.4 million last time I checked. I'm sure it's closer to 3.6, 3.7 now. So enjoy your book. Now, last one. And I'm going to give somebody some grief there if you get this. Who is the most followed on Twitter? Anyone? Justin Bieber. No, no. 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 Not Phil Simon. <laughs> I number million, one million something. Nobody. All right, here's a hint. Way too many. I got to do the next one. It is Katy Perry. We'll do number two, though, to give away the book. Does anyone know number two? Somebody said it before. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. Who said Biebs? Biebs. There you go. At least you didn't get it on the first try, but yes. There were some other good guesses like Barack Obama, but as of this morning when I was putting this together, Biebs is number two. Katy Perry's at 55 million and change. Uh, Biebs is at 53 and change. Obama is nine behind Biebs. YouTube, the official YouTube feed. And then finally, Taylor Swift. Some interesting Twitter facts. TwitterCounter.com. Um, you could have a lot of fun with that and waste a whole lot of time. More interesting Twitter facts, and I want to get to some of the visualizations in a bit. It is responsible for roughly 30% of all global social sharing, and roughly 30% of airtime tweets are sent during commercials. I find this really interesting. I'm old enough to remember the single screen experience. I don't do that anymore. A lot of people have their phones next to them or their tablet computers. Right? In fact, does anyone remember a couple years ago during the Super Bowl, during the power outage and the Oreos got on social media tweeting with hashtag? I read analyses that estimated the value that Oreo Nabesco got from that at something like $5 million from just understanding Twitter. So people are using Twitter in really interesting ways. Everyone's heard of the hashtag, right? It's funny, when um, the first time that I met Chris and um, he gave a talk and I gave a talk, I was talking about Twitter and cash tags. If you put a dollar sign, AAPL, you can click on it and see Apple. Now, I don't know if Twitter's rolled that out yet, but um, there are all sorts of different innovations coming out of Twitter. In fact, at one point, I read there were a million apps based off the Twitter API application programming interface. Let's say that 95% of them suck or they don't work. Okay, you have 5% that are actually useful. That's 50,000 potentially useful applications. That is very much the platform thinking I've talked about before. This is an amazing stat. It was a Wired article I read a while ago about Twitter's new infrastructure being able to support 18 quintillion accounts. That's a really big number. There are about 7 billion people on the planet, and a quintillion is a one with a whole lot of zeros. 
If everyone on Earth were on Twitter, that person could have 2.6 billion separate accounts. Twitter is not going to run out of space anytime soon. Before, and I saw a few people before, you have a, a Ruby sticker, Ruby on Rails. Twitter in its infancy was based on Ruby on Rails. It's an open source back end. Around 2010, the company realized that it was becoming a big deal. We saw the Twitter fail well quite a bit. Twitter was at this point of inflection. It could either sell out to a company like Google for four or five billion dollars, or it could say we're in it for the long term. And if that's the case, we can't keep going down every day because Brett Favre threw a touchdown pass on Monday Night Football or a referee screwed up a call. So Twitter blew away the back end with Ruby and threw in something called ScaleUp. And now with its existing architecture and the fact that it has a ton of cash, it's a publicly traded company worth $25 billion, Twitter is not running out of space anytime soon. Now, there are a lot of different uses for Twitter data, and this is one of my favorites. Um, researching the book, I came across a guy in Spain by the name of Santiago Ortiz. On Twitter, he's at Moebio, M-O-E-B-I-O. And he's a fascinating data scientist. He creates a lot of really interesting data visualizations and algorithms, all based on data. And he was able to comb through a bunch of Twitter data. And he discovered something really neat. Ortiz scraped together tweets and Twitter handles from a public list and was able to see for about 1,250 users, 100,000 total tweets, how people were tweeting at each other. This is based on some of that geolocation data I was talking about before. Now he did this on his own, but the guys from Twitter thought it was really neat and they started applying it internally and they could see, because Twitter's a global company, which employees were tweeting at each other in a very visual way which departments, which countries were tweeting at each other. And they were able to use this information to see if they had any communication issues inside the organization. Uh, there's a lot more to this. If you Google Phil Simon Twitter Wired, I write for Wired, you can see a whole article that I did that goes into this in more detail. But there is a really interesting way of looking at this data and seeing things that you wouldn't necessarily see. Uh, in the book, I talk about data discovery and this notion that we don't necessarily know what we're looking for. If someone says, can you write a report that tells me X or it tells me something else, then you can do that, but you know exactly what you're trying to find. With tools like this, you don't know what you're trying to find. Another company that I profile in the book is Autodesk. And when I did a book tour for this back in April of this year, I went to Autodesk headquarters. And from the vibe I'm getting here at Zappos and from the people I know at the company, you all would really like it there. I saw my first 3D printer. Uh, just a very hip, kind of maker-friendly workplace. And when I was researching the book, I came across an Autodesk employee named Justin Majeka up in Toronto. I liked him immediately because my favorite band, Rush, is from Toronto. Majeka took a whole bunch of data at Autodesk over a four-year period, and he created the following. At the center of this world is the CEO, and this is the Autodesk organization. In over a four, four and a half year period, you see people moving inside of the organization. Maybe it's a promotion, maybe it's a transfer, maybe there's a reorg, maybe people leave the company. And he, I slowed it down, but you can pause this, you can zoom in, you could rewind it, and you can Google or org chart to read a lot more about it. But to me, this was a really interesting way of looking at data. By way of background, before I began writing and speaking, I used to work as a systems consultant. I would help companies implement different enterprise applications. My specialty was HR and payroll applications. I wrote thousands of employee reports. Give me all the transfers, give me a turnover rate, right? And some of them were pretty cool. Nothing compared to this. Again, this doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on, but it makes you go, why is that green thing happening on the left? Is there something going on there? Is there a management issue? Are people leaving the organization or moving away from this particular sector? Is there something going on culturally? culturally? And I know from listening to Tony's talks and meeting him a few times, culture is really big with him. This is the kind of tool that I think could help people understand what's going on in the organization really in a supplemental capacity. It doesn't change the need for a simple listing. How many positions do we have open? But those tools, even though they're useful, can't possibly do what something like org, org chart does. Has anyone heard of Enron? OK. Never know. Enron is a really interesting study. And this was another um, thing I came across in the book. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was an American energy company that, at one point, Fortune magazine named as the most innovative company 
in the United States for six consecutive years. Except it wasn't. It was just all pretty much fraud. Because of Enron and other companies like Tyco, many people in accounting have to deal with something called Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX. In effect, it makes it more difficult for you in a way to do your job because the government wants to prevent more billion dollar bankruptcies. Thousands of people lost their jobs, lost their retirement accounts because the entire thing was basically built on ether. They kept moving money around. They want to prevent it. Um, great book slash documentary, The Smartest Guys in the Room About Enron. I'm actually touching upon this as I research the new book. Just really interesting stuff. And some people look at it and say, well, gosh, there's no way we could have known that this was going to happen. Even though there were reporters like Bethany McLean, who co-authored that book, who were saying from the beginning, I don't understand how you make money. Maybe I'm just dumb. No one can give me a straight answer. Well, what if you could look at internal communications within Enron to identify a potential problem? Well, that's exactly what this one company did, although, to be fair, it was in hindsight. And there's a company I discovered researching the book called Ayazdi, which is Cherokee for to seek. The company purchased 537,000 emails and they started running semantic analysis on them, basically looking at the meaning of words. This isn't just a simple keyword search, although that can be helpful, right? If an employee is screaming that something is untenable or something is a crisis, something is fraudulent, that's kind of a red flag, but sometimes it's a lot more subtle than that. And Ayazdi was able to identify very specific points at which emails to outside people raised a red flag. Now, there's nothing we can do about that now, and Ron's been bankrupt now for 13 years, but that's the type of tool, the type of visualization that might help people avoid subsequent disasters. Now, these are very much big companies, right? Enron and Autodesk and Twitter. What can you do if you're just an individual person? Well, we live in an era, I think, of remarkable technology, and I, as I said before, am a bit of a geek. I wound up looking at my tweets through this company called Visify, and this is a bubble plot of all of my tweets. I mentioned before that I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. I ran it through this company, Visify, that was acquired, I think, the day after the book came out by Yahoo. So you, you can't use this now, but tools like this are definitely on the internet. And this just shows my tweets over time with the hashtag of Breaking Bad. Right? It looks like I took about a month off. I don't know why that happened. And this is from April to November of 2013. Maybe the show wasn't on. But I would bet that if it was on, then my tweets happened on a Sunday because I was probably watching the show on Sunday night going, I can't believe what just happened. Then here are some tweets on my previous book, Too Big to Ignore. Again, a different picture. You won't see anything before, oh, I don't know, maybe November of, mm, no, I'd say maybe a bit before. I didn't know the title of my book. How could I have a hashtag? Right? So there was nothing before I decided to call the book too big to ignore and then started tweeting about it. I mentioned I was a big fan of Rush. These are my tweets for the band Rush. Looks like I took about a month off, but I'm pretty consistent. And then finally, I thought this was also really interesting. Here are my tweets as a function of time around big data. I guarantee you that I peaked right around the time the book was coming out because I have to be not just a writer and a speaker, but also a bit of a marketer. So these were the things I was tweeting about over about a six month period. But another question that Visify let me or really anyone else at the time easily answer was, when do you tweet? Now, if you go back 10, 12 years ago, and there was no Twitter, but you would typically throw this data into Excel or Access, you would parse it, right? You would remove it, you would play with the data, and then you would start to create it. Didn't do, have to do any of that. Through the Twitter API, which is relatively open, not as open as it used to be, you can do many things like this. Does anyone here work with the Twitter API? I'm just curious. A few people? OK. So you know more about it than I do. I asked myself, when do I tweet? Now, I am a morning person. I wake up around 5 o'clock, usually just up, have a cup of coffee, start writing. Um, and my tweets reflect that. My tweets are typically happening pretty early in the morning. I guess I did tweet at 2 or 2.30 in the morning a few times. Now, there's an interesting dip here around 10 o'clock. That's usually when I go to the gym. By that point, I've written for four or five hours. It's time for me to get my yayas out. I go to the gym. And I very rarely tweet at midnight because I'm never up. Now, you can auto-tweet. There are all sorts of different ways to schedule tweets. But for the most part, you won't find me tweeting. And this visualization proved that. 
When I saw things like this, I started to say to myself, we are really living in a different time. Data is becoming more and more important. People have heard the phrase, I'm sure, data is the new oil. Right. One of my favorite quotes in the book is from James Barksdale. And he's a very famous guy. He was one of the co-founders of Netscape. And he said, if we have data, let's use data. If we have only opinions, then let's use mine. And I think that's a very sort of telling quote these days. I don't have any more books to give away, but this one's really obscure. Does anyone know who this one is? Okay, this is Christian Chabot, and he is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Tableau Software. Tableau went public about 18 months ago, give or take, almost a year to the day that Facebook had gone public. Now, I'm kicking myself because I could have bought Facebook at what, 18, and what is it now, 75? I'm convinced, though, that if I did buy it at 18, it would have dropped down to 9, but that's just the effect that I have on stocks. You don't want to know when I bought Apple. Tableau goes public a year to the day, pretty much, that Facebook had gone public. Facebook went like this. Tableau went like that, 63% one day, $2 billion valuation. Tableau only visualizes data. And it's not the only company that does it. If you go back 20 years, companies like Oracle, SAP, Microsoft with Excel and Access have all contained uh, data visualization functionality in their software. But Tableau only does data this. That's it. They're based up in Seattle. This company explodes, goes public, goes up 63% while Facebook had cast such a pall over the market that Twitter reportedly delayed its IPO because it was scared. It did not want to go public and drop down. So I started thinking about when a data viz company is worth $2 billion, we're living in this era of, of data visualization. And I wanted to write a book about it, how companies could make sense out of all this data. Right? We have just more and more data than ever. One of my favorite stats is from a book called The Human Face of Big Data. It is the biggest book on big data ever. This thing is bigger than my laptop. It's huge. I got it in the mail and said, what did I order? And the stat from the book is that the average person today is exposed to more information in a single day than someone in the 15th century was in his or her entire lifetime. We are constantly being bombarded with information. In 1972, I discovered this research in the new book, the average person was exposed to around 500 marketing messages a day. Does anyone know what that number is today? Thousands, 5,000, tenfold increase on average. Well, why? We're not looking at newspapers anymore that contain finite space. We're looking at devices and Facebook feeds and Twitter feeds that are streaming ads at us all the time. So we're constantly being bombarded with information. And I wanted to look at how progressive companies were turning this into actual insights and what we can learn from them. When you think about it, we're constantly being surrounded by data, presented with data. Has anyone heard of the sort of counter movement to this, the slow web? Sure. Okay. There are actually people who think that they ought to disconnect, right? You hear about these retreats. I think even Burning Man does this, right? You, you can't bring an electronic device in because we're being bombarded with so much information, not just companies, but employees, consumers, governments. I've seen some really interesting visualizations on things like traffic patterns, visual citizens, visual journalists, and then visual athletes, and I'll give an example of that in a bit. I'm a big Pulp Fiction fan, and my moment of clarity, I think, around this book took place in June of 2012. I was walking down the street in Manhattan a few minutes before a speaking event, and I saw this dry cleaner that had a simple data viz outside of its store on the street of its Yelp reviews. Now, this isn't anything exotic, but when a dry cleaner goes, hmm, people want to see data in a visual way, that's going to be more effective than putting up a sign saying people love us on Yelp took this picture. It's not in the book, but I thought this was a very interesting um, finding. Now, if you go on Yelp, and I'm not that big of a fan of Yelp, but occasionally I'll stay at a hotel and have a good experience or go to a restaurant and have a bad experience. I say, you know what? Writing for me is very cathartic. I joke with people, if I didn't write my first book, I would have needed to see a shrink. I'm not kidding. It feels good to let things out. You go on Yelp and you do a couple clicks. This didn't take any import, export, Excel, any of that. You can easily see where your reviews take place. Now, I moved to Vegas three years ago from New Jersey. I was living in West Caldwell. There you go. That's why West Caldwell was there. But most of my Yelp reviews are from Las Vegas. I stayed at um, a restaurant. In, I'm sorry, I went to a restaurant in Portland. I thought it was a little disappointing. That's why you see Portland. But that's just one way of cutting the data. What are my most reviewed categories? And anyone can do this on Yelp. 
It turns out that I rate a lot of restaurants and home services companies, hotels and travel, but there are some in there that are from nightlife. Maybe I went to a nightclub or something. So companies like Yelp understand that they need to give people tools to manage their data, to see it, to understand it. Even though they don't necessarily make money off of that, they help you, they want it to be sticky. They don't want you to have to do something in Excel. Does anyone know who this is? Ray Allen. Uh, played last year with the Miami Heat. He's the all-time NBA leader in three-point shots. And I, I believe he just turned 40 years old. This is a shot chart. This is where Ray Allen is most effective on the court. Um, NBA teams, really all sports teams, are starting to get into analytics. Has anyone ever seen the movie or read the book Moneyball? Okay. Billy Bean, for those of you who don't know, was the, um, actually still is, the general manager of the Oakland A's. And he didn't have a big budget. Right? He had a payroll cap at $60 million. That sounds really high, but Boston and the, the New York Yankees spend three, four times that much. How do you compete if you have a small budget? Data. Many general managers and sports types are actually looking at different ways. With Ray Allen here, the Miami coach, Eric Spolstra, used to run plays to specifically line up Ray Allen for the corner three because that's where he makes a lot of shots. And the other teams, of course, know this. If you look at the chart here, red means he hits a lot of shots, green means he doesn't. He doesn't take a lot of 17-foot two-point shots. Why? If you're behind the line in basketball and a three-point shot, yes, your odds go down a little bit, but the difference between a two-point shot and a three-point shot is 50% higher. So there are a lot of sports visualizations that are out there. Athletes are being more visual. Now, a lot of people don't like this, Right? In fact, if you watch the movie, there are people, uh, scouts, who hate Billy Bean because they're basically saying your entire career has been wrong. You're doing it wrong. You don't know a good player. I know a good player because I have data to back things up. Please tell me you know who this is. In 2013, Elon Musk became involved in a bit of a brouhaha with John Broder of the New York Times. Musk makes some claims about Tesla cars' performance. Now, Broder wanted to determine if those claims were true. So he went out and he carefully tracked what he was doing, where he was driving, how fast, when he recharged. And he said, you know what? I've run the numbers. Musk's claims aren't true. I have the data to prove it. Musk didn't like that. This is the first time I can recall, and maybe it's happened before, that I've ever seen a CEO and a reporter arguing over data. Now. This is not the first book on data visualization. When I was 19, I was at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Any Tartan alumni out there? Probably the single worst nickname for a school. In fact, um, a site just named Carnegie Mellon as the geekiest school out there, or even ahead of MIT. But I remember in that course on empirical research methods, I got this book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tufte. And it's still a classic today. That guy knows a thousand times more about data visualization than I do. But I didn't see a lot of books that looked at case studies, what actual companies were doing. Not a theoretical book about how you should build a pie chart or a bar graph, but how companies were actually doing this. In fact, if you compare this to enterprise resource planning case studies or customer relationship management case studies, the data viz case studies simply aren't there. And a lot of the ones that are there are actually from software vendors going, look at all of our data viz case studies. So I didn't see a book that took this particular approach. And as I think about what all this means to you and your jobs um, and becoming a visual organization, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the findings from the book. These companies eschew this notion of set it and forget it. In 2003, when I was doing consulting living in New Jersey, I went to a company and they were implementing a system, to make a long story short, I needed to take data from one place, massage it, and send it to another place. There's a term for that in the IT world. It's called Extract, Transform, and Load, or ETL. I built this tool. It worked. They were happy. I left. About six years later, they call me back for an upgrade. So I recognize a few faces. I'm saying hello to people. And I go up to this one woman, and she has her screen open. And it's a Microsoft Access database. And that's how I used to build these tools when I was a PC guy, I'm a Mac guy now. And I'm looking at it going, you have really great design sensibilities. And she goes, she starts laughing at me. She goes, you don't remember this, do you? You built this for us. I said, oh, okay, great. Does it still work and did you change it? She says, yes, it still works and no, we didn't change it. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but when you think about the area in which we're living, 
things change so frequently. Um, I remember three, four years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data from Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. And they were really struggling with it because it's a lot of data. Then Pinterest comes along. And people would say, well, now I got to worry about Pinterest. I don't even have my arms around this other stuff. Well, look at Pinterest engagement numbers. They're actually extremely high, particularly with women who make a lot of the purchasing decisions in-house. So you can ignore all these data sources, but I think there's this real danger in saying that something worked three years ago, I'm sure it probably still works today. What are you missing out on? These companies also encourage data exploration and discovery. Again, if you build a tool like org org chart or some of those Twitter tools, they don't necessarily point you in the right direction, right? You can't look at it and say X equals six, but you might see something go, well, why does that happen? Maybe I need to investigate that. Maybe I need to look at this a little bit more. These companies also recognize the limitations of these existing reporting tools. Uh, this doesn't mean that dashboards are going away or key performance indicators, KPI or standard reports, all those are very important. When my accountant asks me for a P&L, I'm not going to create some fancy data visualization for her. What's the point? And I wish that I sold enough books and I had that data so I could actually play with it. Um, has, has anyone here ever published anything through Amazon? Okay, they actually make this interactive data visual tool available under something called Author Central, but they leave a key thing out. I can go on Amazon right now and see a heat map of where I've sold my books. And I can filter it by books. I can say, well, just give me the visual organization. Amazon will color code it such that I, I know I sell a lot of books in Seattle or San Francisco. I don't sell a lot of books in Omaha or in Albuquerque. But I don't know who buys those books. And some people say, well, doesn't that suck? Well, maybe it does. But think about it. If I knew who bought my books, why do I need Amazon? I don't. So Amazon anonymizes the data. But I can still play around with it, even with that limitation. And say, if I'm going to set up a Google AdWord campaign, Seattle and San Francisco seem like pretty decent places because at least I have some sort of traction there versus a place like, say, Baltimore. I don't know if anyone's buying my books there. These companies buy and build new tools as necessary. I didn't talk about it much today, but it's all over the book. Um, is anyone here a Netflix subscriber? OK. Netflix has 50 million subscribers. They are constantly looking at different ways of keeping you subscribed, right? Because think about it. This is not AT&T. This is not Verizon. You don't have a two-year contract with Netflix. You subscribe for as long as you like. Now, the problem for them is to find an algorithm that actually works. Does anyone remember five, six years ago, they offered a million dollars as a prize to anybody who could build basically a better mousetrap, a better algorithm. And they paid it off, and the, the algorithm was significantly better. Netflix discovered that the cover imagery on a TV show or a movie actually made a difference. Uh, everyone here has heard of Orange is the New Black. You might have a penchant for orange comedies, like, say, Arrested Development, also orange color. You might not care at all. You might like red dramas. The point is, Netflix was willing to ask the question, and because of that, they actually segment their subgenres into something like 77,000 different ones. And you say, wait a minute, drama, documentary, how do you get to 77,000? Here's how. They're incredibly granular. Things like evil kid movies from the 1980s, like the Chucky films. I'm not kidding. Um, you can Google it. Um, this is also another piece that I wrote for Wired if you're curious about Netflix. The point is that Netflix management did not go into Staples or Office Depot and go, yeah, can you give us the tool that quantifies the precise HTML colors of our movies? They don't make that tool. Netflix built it. And they built it not knowing if it would actually work at all. But at Netflix, and I spoke at Netflix headquarters, really believes in the power of data. Netflix had this um, trophy in the corner. And I go, oh, is that the Emmy, right? House of Cards. Netflix was the first non-TV network to win an Emmy. Say, no, that's not a real Emmy. What is it? It's a tech Emmy. Netflix actually won a technology Emmy. There is such a thing. I didn't even know about it. At Netflix, they have data visualizations on the wall. So Netflix is very much, in the book, what I call the quintessential visual organization. Um, but you certainly don't have to be the biggest company or a company with, uh, what's their market cap now? Something like $80 billion. Size really doesn't matter. Does anyone know he used to work here at uh, Zappos? Jimmy Jacobson? OK. Yeah, Jimmy's a friend of mine here. I actually profile wedgies in the book. This is a six-person card up. 
startup wedgies they do social polling in fact uh, we were talking before I was I use wedgies to get some to collect my own data for how people like the cover samples for the new book and they very much understand the importance of data they built their company in such a way that if they have six people now and a thousand users if they grow to 60 or 600 and a million users the company still makes sense they use data visualization not only on the front end when you're creating a tool you can create a very visual experience but also on the back end trying to figure out what's going on their product is very much based on data and data visualization and this is a six person company when I talk to people from more mature companies they say well we're a thousand person people we don't have anywhere near the resources of a Netflix or a Twitter I say so what you don't need to be you can do things even on an individual level with just a few clicks of your mouse there are a lot of myths around data viz and I'll go for about eight, ten more minutes, and then I'll, I'll answer a few questions. One of which is that we have to visualize all of the data to begin. Nonsense. I don't have all the data from Amazon, but I can still use some of their tools to better understand where my books are selling. You're never going to have all the data. I don't know of anybody who says, yeah, we have it all, right? Particularly if you're looking at external sources. Some of you may have heard the term, I don't need any more data, I actually need more information or need more knowledge and need more insights. There's also this notion that we should only visualize the good data, and I think that's absolute nonsense as well. If you ever look at a data set and you visualize it very simply with, say, a, a histogram or a scatter plot, you might see at what the statisticians would call an outlier, what's going on over there. This is not a book on neuroscience. I am not a brain surgeon. I don't know how the human brain works, especially the female brain, but that's a totally different discussion. But during the research, I discovered that the human brain understands information presented in a visual format anywhere from 60 to 60,000 times faster than if you're looking at, say, hard data, uh, a feed, uh, the Twitter fire hose, or a bunch of data in Excel or a database table. So if you can visualize all the data, you're more likely to see something that just doesn't make any sense and then correct it versus saying, oh, no, 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 we have to wait till the data is perfect. The data may never be perfect. There's also this notion that the visualization will always manifest the right action or the right decision. Again, business is not science. If you look at the evolution of management theory, I think a lot of consultants and management gurus today still suffer from this notion that management isn't really a science, right? I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. Walter White was a chemist. In a chemistry lab, you can control environment factors, right? You could hold everything in the environment <coughs> constant. You can't do that in business. And I've read a bunch of books. I actually gave a, a talk at the Tech Cocktail event about a year ago, I'm an expert, don't trust me, about the difficulty of laying down these sort of hard, fast, scientific laws of business. They just don't exist. Visualization can certainly help you understand what's going on, but I don't believe that it necessarily points to the right decision, nor that it guarantees any sort of certainty. How do you know if something's going to work? I'd argue you basically don't. You have management experts who'll tell you, you should stick to your knitting, right? You should only do a few things, right? Well, why is Google spending $3 billion on Nest? If it's a search company, why are you buying a company that makes thermostats? Well, Google is trying to get into some different things and hedge its bets. That seems to be the right move for Google, but in five years, we may look back and say that was a waste of money. Here are a few lessons from the book. User experience and participation are essential. When I talked to Justin Majeka from Org Org Chart and Autodesk, I said, tell me about your process. How did you develop such a cool tool? I'm not a Star Trek guy, but this looks like something straight out of Star Trek. I said, did you sit down and just bang it out and tell people, here you go? He said, absolutely not, that would be dumb. He wanted to involve people early on. In early iterations of Org Org Chart, Majeka worked with the HR people at Autodesk and said, hey, what do you think of this prototype? It's not perfect, right? It's an MVP, minimal viable product, but am I on the right track? Will you use it if I go in this direction? He involved people early on. In many cases, it wasn't a linear process. He might be developing in one track and then say, no, 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 if I want to get to where they need it to be, I need to take a step back. It's also important to experiment. There's no guarantee that things will work. You may throw something out there and decide that, you know what, this just isn't working. People aren't using it particularly well. Um, it's also important to walk before you can run. And I've discussed this in several books. The last book was on big data. And in previous books, I've talked about Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. And people say, we can't do what these companies can do. Agreed. But think about it. Five years ago, Google couldn't do what it does today. Did anyone see that CBS bit on Amazon with the drones? few months ago, right? 
Now, I don't know if that's going to happen. There are a lot of hurdles there, but Amazon is trying to do things in five years that it can't do today. So you have to think of it more as an evolution. You're not going to go from zero to Amazon or zero to Facebook overnight. I recommend to people that they avoid what I call the quarterly visualization mentality. In other words, in more mature companies, from what I've seen as a consultant, people will only visualize data at the end of the quarter or the end of the year. Oh, my boss needs me to put together a bunch of slides that show this, that, and the other thing. At visual organizations, people are constantly interacting with data. It's part of their jobs. This is why these interactive tools are very important. In the book, I put forth this notion that a static data viz on small structured data, things that you can see in Excel, can certainly be valuable. It helps me understand my own business. But if I were dealing with petabytes of unstructured data and I didn't know what was going on, I would need an interactive tool. Those tend to be helpful as well. Again, all data is not required to begin. And then finally, it's important to iterate. It's very unlikely that what you're building now will necessarily work as well, if at all, as these new data types and new data sources stream at us. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. This is how you get in touch with me, and I think we have time for some questions. Sure, for those of you who didn't hear, the question was around Netflix and the images. Yeah. Netflix has technology that looks at every offering in its catalog, TV show, uh, movie, documentary, what a cartoon, whatever. And for every, let's say you're all Netflix customers, it can effectively determine what kinds of things each people like. And that information goes into their algorithm. In other words, if you happen to like orange comedies or um, black dramas, like, perfect example, House of Cards. Does anyone, everyone know the cover from House of Cards? Kevin Sp it's black, Kevin Space is in a suit, he's 52, 53 years old. That is actually very similar to Macbeth from PBS with Patrick Stewart. Now, Patrick Stewart doesn't have as much hair, but it's a very similar one. And knowing if you're a House of Cards fan, Netflix would be more inclined to recommend something. Again, it's not the only factor, right? If you hated House of Cards, it's not necessarily going to recommend something just because it's the color. But that's what statisticians would call an independent variable. It's one of the things that would help them determine what to recommend to you next. Does that help? OK. There's more of it in the book. Um, and if you want, uh, there's um, a Wired piece I wrote on Netflix. Or if you just shoot me an email, it's phil at philsimon.com. I'll send you the link. But I do go into more detail in it. And Netflix was very helpful. But these companies, even though we live in this very transparent era, people talk about privacy being dead. Uh, that hasn't been my experience when I get comp my friends even from Facebook or Netflix or, or Google to say, hey, can you help a brother out? I'm writing a book. They'll tell me flat out, no, we, we can't talk about this because if you think about the way the business is going, you know, with AWS,